Tim, thanks for coming on, man, on such short notice. It's always fun, um, you know, to geek out over agriculture with another, like I said on Twitter today earlier, another greatest of all time in the in the ag podcasting space. Uh, well, I, I do not know about that, but I'm, I'm always up for a conversation about ag, especially with a fellow podcaster, because uh, I, I, it's not often that I get to actually talk to other podcasters because both of us <laughs> and, and other uh, people who have shows are just so busy on putting out content every week. Yeah, it, it's weird. I mean, geeking out over podcasting, like it's weird being a guest as a podcaster. Like you're you feel so much more pressure because you're like, normally I only do like five minutes of talking in the whole episode. It's like, well, shoot, now I've got to talk for 45 minutes. So it's a very weird role reversal. So no pressure. No, nah, no problem at all. No, it is. <laughs> it, and I, it's a good exercise for me of giving up control. You know, like when you're the host, you get to control where things go and how deep you go into things. Uh, but when you're the guest, it's a, it is a little bit more unnerving, but no, no problem. We'll, we'll roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I shot you um, a Twitter message the, the other day about, you know, let's talk about some ag stuff. You have been covering um, ag history topics a lot on your podcast, The Future of Food, and uh, or The Future of Agriculture. And one thing that you talked about a lot was the the history of soybeans in the United States. And also, this blows my mind. I, I would love for you to cover this first. Um, how we converted atmospheric nitrogen to um, fixed nitrogen and how that kind of changed agriculture. Yeah, I'm so glad you're asking me about this because it's actually fresh on my mind. Uh, as you know, with po with podcasting, I always remember like my last five episodes, and before that, I have yep. to really think about it. <laughs> uh, so, yes, it's an it's an amazing story, and it's one I think a lot of us in agriculture take for granted that you know chemical nitrogen fertilizers uh, are relatively new in the grand scheme of history. In mm. fact, they are are in a lot of ways the building block for our modern agriculture and our modern food system. You know, without them, uh, and, and we have a lot of documentation of what things look like without them, right? So 100 years ago, there was a very, very real concern that we would not be able to feed ourselves. Uh, as we talk about today, growing population, they were experiencing the same thing, growing population, but they literally could not figure out how in the world are we supposed to get the nutrients we need to produce the food? I mean, a very real problem. So they had you know, they had uh, been shipping guano from off the coast of Peru. They basically cleaned out uh, just just like stories and stories high of manure that had that had accumulated there for years and shipped mm -hmm. that around the world as fertilizer. Uh, they were um, mining um, nitrate sands from Chile. And that was really the, the source of two thirds of our nitrogen at the turn of the century, you know, heading in the 20th century. So anyway, there's a very real concern about sustainability, but sustainability in that, like the math doesn't add up. We literally don't have the nutrients we need to produce the, the crops we need. So long story short, um, some scientists, mostly chemists, uh, we're looking at certainly there's got to be a way because nitrogen's in the air. It's all around us that we can make that somehow usable to the crops without just relying on on the natural occurring microbes, which do fix nitrogen, but on a very slowly, very small scale, not a small scale, but a very slow process. Right. Mm -hmm. Not one that can feed us. Um, and luckily, you know, some chemists made some headway, including a guy named Fritz Haber, who uh, ended up. Um, licensing, well, or selling his technology to BASF, which developed this process called the Haber Bosch. But what I loved about the story is the guy at BASF, this like mid level chemist named Carl Bosch, who's 35 years old, and the boss at BASF kind of says, Well, what do you think? And he's like, I think we can make it work. But he had to basically mm -hmm. change everything about the process in order to actually make it a uh, commercial scale. Because when BASF got it, it was putting out like milliliters of ammonia, very, very small oh. scale, very slowly. And he scaled it up to this process that we know today. And really, um, I think this the fact is about half of the nitrogen that's in each of our bodies comes from the Haber-Bosch process. So this ag technology that was developed um, really is the source of all of our nitrogen, all of our nitrogen today, or at least the vast majority of it. And uh, it's really how we are able to have agriculture and food systems on the scales today that, that feed you know nearly eight billion people. It's That's wild. So, so like, how does that process work exactly? Like, how do they get it out from the atmosphere and then like, I don't know, get it from a gas to a solid where we can then apply it to crops? Uh, you're going to need to get way smarter people than me on the show to tell you exactly, <laughs> but I'll tell you, you know, it's a, it's a process that involves very, very intense heat and very, very intense pressure and a catalyst. So the catalyst, okay. and this is a funny part of the story, right? The catalyst that, uh, Fritz Haber first used when he developed the process is called osmium. Well, there was like 
very, very little osmium on the face of the earth. They're like so mm-hmm. little that it would have never worked with osmium. So they had to start from scratch and finding a new catalyst. And they ended up finding an iron based kind of chemical mix to use as a uh, as a catalyst. And I believe the same one they use today. So, yeah, it's a uh, high pressure, high heat. They use a catalyst and uh, basically, you know, take take atmospheric nitrogen so very very little input going in right and catalyze mm-hmm. it through this process that uh, ends up giving us the ammonia based products that we have today interesting so I, I i listened to parts of that interview and the first thing that i thought of was like a new technology that i've i've literally done no research on it is a startup and they're trying to get protein from the atmosphere like it's the, these huge nets they're trying to develop and as different gases and whatever goes through it, it somehow collects enough molecules to create protein. And it's going to be like an alternative protein. So it's not plant based. I guess it's like cloud based protein or something. Have you heard of that technology? I've I've just heard about it. I don't know much about it. I will say it doesn't sound real appetizing to me compared to oh, like yeah, no. a steak. <laughs> but but I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure that I mean it's it's super interesting, right? Like the inputs to something like that, if you can have the energy required, and actually that's another thing. Haber Bosch process today uses about one percent, I think it is, of of our total energy use as a planet. So it uses a lot of energy, but um, it's it's pretty amazing, you know, what technology can do. And yeah, I I, I have no reason to doubt that they could potentially theoretically pull protein out of the air. Um, but I don't, I don't know a whole lot about how they're doing that. Yeah, same. And th- that energy thing is something that I've heard a lot about um, when it comes to like cellular agriculture, for example, like yeah. it's a good alternative. If you don't want quote unquote, like normal animal meat, you can have cellular agriculture. It's real meat, but not, but like the, the main pain point for that is you need those bioreactors to grow the cells and help them replicate over and over again but it's very energy um, intensive. And so that's one of the major downsides of it. Like it's a great alternative meat, but you know, is it going to be more, is it going to be better for the environment when it's a lot more um, energy required? So that's very interesting. It is. Yeah. And I'm so glad you started with this history of ag stuff because it has been a good reminder that breakthrough technology happens extremely slowly and then and then all at mm-hmm. once. And, and especially it happens usually on a small scale that naysayers say like, who cares? You can drip out milliliters of ammonia. That's not going to save the world. Right. And and then it takes somebody like Carl Bosch to say, like, OK, well, what if we change the catalyst? What if we change the the uh, the material that the chamber's made out of? OK, well, now we, we're running into all sorts of new issues and keep solving those problems over and over again. And that's why I love interviewing entrepreneurs right because those are the people usually sometimes they've invented the technology themselves but a lot of times they're trying to figure out ways to commercialize the technology but it is a slow process and i think that's exactly where cellular meat is i think cellular meat is here to stay it doesn't Mm -hmm. mean it's going to take over right and in a lot of ways it looks like that initial prototype fritz haber had back in 1909 of like you know, dripping out little bits of ammonia, uh, which, you know, never is going to reach wide scale until it does. And I, I, I think cellular ag is the same way. Uh, I think there'll always be room for animal agriculture, but I don't think that cellular meat is going anywhere. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be a great compliment. I don't think it's ever going to replace traditional agriculture. I think it might be something, I don't know, that, be, that becomes more readily available in the future, like maybe in urban areas, kind of depends where you are. I, I think it would be like a cool experience maybe for like fine dining, like maybe Michelin star chefs could somehow make their own meats. I don't know. Like, I think that'd be kind of cool, but, but yeah, I think it'll be a good compliment. And I think about it in terms of like vertical agriculture, which we can talk about later on or vertical farming. I think that those two industries, traditional growing and vertical farming are going to be very cohesive in the future, just like traditional um, livestock farming and cellular agriculture. Like they're not going to replace one, one another. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it uh, it'll it'll be interesting the creative ways as you alluded to that that you can use cellular agriculture. It causes you maybe the 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 low hanging fruit is to replicate what we already eat, and that's interesting. Yeah. But then maybe, you know, further down the evolution is is more like, okay, well, what can we do here to make protein tasty and interesting and uh, a unique experience? And I think about sushi in that way, right? Like I I would totally go to like a cellular sushi restaurant and just try like new spin spin-offs of like, you know, tasty bite of protein. Um I don't know. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, that's a really cool way to think about it. Because, I mean, I don't know if, I guess if you had um, cellular sushi, you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, having bad fish, maybe like maybe that would take the risk out of it. So that would be a great example for it. I mean, you wouldn't have to worry about getting food poisoning or or, or getting sick anytime you have sushi. Win-win. 
or overfishing or some of the crazy yeah. stuff that happens, you know, in our oceans. Um, I there there are opportunities, but I think you and I are aligned that like, you know, am I going to be debating intensely at my local grocery store whether <laughs> I buy my hamburger that's cellular or from a cow? Probably not anytime soon. Yeah, no, 100%. So what are some other cool um, ag history topics that you've either been learning about, interviewing about that you've kind of covered in the past couple months? Yeah, so I, I've just put out two episodes that were exclusively focused on history. And as a podcaster, you'll appreciate this. My initial motivation is like, I just want to try a new format. Like, I want to mm-hmm. try something where most of the work is upfront in research. And then like the the podcast itself is just sort of me sharing what, I, what I've uh, been learning. And so I've only done two like that. The, the first one we've already talked about with Haber Bosch process, uh, or excuse me, the most recent one was Haber Bosch. The first one was with a guy named William J. Morris, who's really the found not the founder, the the father, I would say, of the modern U.S. soybean industry. And the, the mm. soybean industry is another one, like the Haber-Bosch process, where if you're not looking into it, you would kind of take for granted that soybeans weren't always the major crop. In fact, in the early 1900s, they were like this obscure forage crop. We didn't even grow them for the beans themselves. Um, now, they were a more major crop in, in Asia, uh, but it took a, a an effort on, on the part of a lot of people, but one of which very instrumentally was this guy named William J. Morse, who worked for the USDA and uh, worked with his colleagues to actually bring in uh, varieties from Asia to mm. test them out. And then he was really he's sort of the Johnny Appleseed of soybeans. Like <laughs> he would he would literally load up in a in a wagon in North Carolina and go farm to farm and say, try these beans. Um, it's pretty amazing, the story. But also now when you look at, you know, soybeans growing on something like 90 million acres, they go back and forth with corn as as, you know, the most uh, significant crop in the U.S. Uh, they really were instrumental in getting the U.S. through the war effort. Um, U.S. doubled production of soybeans in one year, I think from like 1940 to 1941. Just oh, wow. incredible. But, you know, that stuff, again, gets back to the point, like that doesn't happen overnight. That amazing feat doesn't happen just because there's a war. It happens because for 30 years leading up to that, people like William Morse were trying to figure this out. And then you know, the catalyst happened, the war happened yeah, okay. in the U.S., you know, farmers were able to double acreage because of all these efforts. Uh, I don't know. I, I love those stories. And it, and it really is a great reminder that in a lot of times history either repeats itself or rhymes, you know, as, as the saying goes. <laughs> and um, we're in a time right now where ag tech's in a, in a, a time of transition, for sure, um, due to venture capital, due to just lack of uh, effective technologies in general due to a number of factors. And it, it's a reminder that, look, you know, it, ag innovation isn't something that showed up when computers showed up in, in ag yeah. technology is not new and it always goes through cycles and it always takes a while, but there's, there's some amazing people throughout history that have willed it into existence. And I don't know, I think that's pretty cool. I like that catalyst standpoint because I've, I noticed something, I started the podcast well before COVID, like 2018. Yeah. And during and after, I really saw a surge of farmers and ranchers offering direct to consumer products. And like the pandemic was the catalyst. It was either because nobody could go, go to their farm, they couldn't sell to restaurants or grocery stores or wherever. And so there was like, okay, either I go out of business or I find some other method to reach my customer. And everybody went direct to consumer. And it's been awesome. Like so many people have either stayed doing that or maybe they changed things up a little bit. They're, we're, maybe they were doing farmer's markets and then they stopped and then they did direct to consumer. But that's that catalyst. Like that was, you know, that, that live or die mentality and that catalyst really kind of helped things blossom. So that's, that's a really cool um, viewpoint, kind of seeing how, like, I don't know where that catalyst impacts everything and then drives that change. Yeah, no, and I'm a believer in that. You know, I'm a, I'm a consumer that likes to buy direct uh, when and where I can. I love mm-hmm. to find new farmers that are doing interesting value added things. Uh, you know, your show covers a lot of the stuff like that, which is uh, I don't know. It's exciting. I and I, that's another thing I think is is here to stay. You know, we we want in some ways a connection to in some in some cases you know I think the common thing to say in agriculture is like we want to know where our food comes from. I don't think it's that. Like I think. For me, at least, I want a deeper connection with my community. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. feel like through technology, through social media, p- point wherever you want to point, we have sort of feel, felt these forces to kind of push us apart as a community. And 
sometimes buying direct from a producer is like that way of like reconnecting with my community. Like we love the, the, the family that we buy our meat from, uh, you know, which is square mile ranch in Wallowa, Oregon. And I don't know, it's just a big part of our lives beyond just food. And to me, it's not knowing where my food comes from. It's a, it's a, it's a tangible way I can connect with my community. I like that. I mean, we kind of hear this term ad nauseum in ag. It's like bridging the gap between farmers and consumers. But yeah, I think it kind of comes back to that um, the community sense, like you want to help out your local community. I mean, like here in Panama city, we have, um, we don't have a lot of beef ranches. We've got a lot of timber farms. We've got a lot of aquaculture and a lot of fishing. And so that's something like everybody wants to support their local fishermen and all that stuff. And yeah, it's, it's kind of, I don't know that community, that sense of community. And I feel like, I don't know, maybe the early nineties, the late nineties, early two thousands, we got away from that as the internet showed us we could order whatever from wherever, like, you know, Amazon. And now we're like, you know what, this is cool, but I don't know, not to, not to get political. We see all those tech developers getting all that money. And we're like, you know, our local communities are kind of struggling. Maybe we should refocus a little bit and support them a little bit with starting with the farmers and ranchers. I mean, there's so many, I don't know, like mom and pop shops that we go to. And I don't know, maybe it's transitioning over to focusing on agriculture, which is great. Right. Yeah. And look, I, I know, you know, for us, at least we, we have to pay a premium for that and not everybody mm -hmm. is in a position to be able to prioritize that spending. And I want to acknowledge that. So I'm, I'm not saying like everyone should just do what I do necessarily, but, um, there is something to be said, uh, for finding businesses that will prioritize quality, even when it's not mm -hmm. in their best interest, they're going to prioritize quality, even if it means making less money. And boy, I want to support companies like that. I like that quality over quantity. And I, yeah. I think we're slowly going back to that um, before it was like, you know, get all the stuff, but now it's like, no, I want less stuff, but better stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, digging into all the history topics you've been learning about, I, I started Googling some stuff last night. Cause I was like, you know what? I'm curious about stuff again here in Florida. We have a lot of timber farming and I started to look all that up. Um, it was super popular back when the Spanish came here and they founded Pensacola and then um, St. Augustine. And if you're in Florida, you know how important it is to say that Pensacola was founded before St. Augustine. That's like a huge battle. Oh, I'm glad you said that because I've been to St. Augustine, never been to Pensacola, and I didn't know that fun fact. Yeah, I forget like the exact age, like how much older um, Pensacola is. But if you go to Pensacola and if somebody says that about St. Augustine being older, they will come out of the woodworks and be like, absolutely not. Pensacola is the oldest and I will die on this hill. <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, um, I mean, because in... In the early 1800s, or, or no, early 1700s, 1800s, there was a lot of sawmills around here, usually small mom and pop ones. There was one in my hometown of Bluntstown, and then um, they really started getting bought out by a big company called the St. Joe Company, and they're here in all of North Florida. Well, then they stopped logging, and then they just went into real estate. And I mean, they are worth millions and millions. Every new development, every new condo coming up, is owned by them and it used to be um logging land hmm. and then i looked it up obviously another popular florida crop is oranges i didn't know those aren't native to florida those came from i believe spain they brought them in there and i'm like huh. oh i didn't know that like florida's most popular crop was brought in fun fact that's amazing yeah and one another cool storyline for you to look up at some point if you because these history episodes are so fun to do i highly recommend oh, i bet it. but um I, I seem to remember something because I help out with the business of blueberries podcast. Mm -hmm. And I seem to remember some sort of controversy where there's Elizabeth white up in New Jersey that was supposedly like kind of brought blueberries to the U S but also there's someone in Florida that I think like there's a bit of controversy of like who was really first Elizabeth white in New Jersey or, or I think it was somebody in Florida. Uh -oh. uh, but I, of course there is the Northern high bush and Southern high bush and you guys are Southern high bush down there, but there's something, there's some sort of interesting story there too. So if you really want to get people riled up in the blueberry industry, you can pick a side on who you think uh, really started it. Oh, nice. Blueberries are native. Up. Blueberries are native to the US. They are. And you know, that's something I, I, I want to find. Actually, you might be a perfect person to, to ask for somebody on this. I didn't know that wild blueberries are actually a thing. I thought it was just like a marketing term, you know, but apparently no. that's like a real thing. And they're like much more nutritious than traditional blueberries. Oh no, now you're getting into it. Uh, no. <laughs> yes. So they, they would certainly argue that they are not more nutritious. And in fact, okay. uh, the, there is a wild blueberry um, 
industry, but they're actually not wild. I mean, they're cultivated is my understanding. I think they also call them rabbit eye. And boy, we're getting really to the edge of my blueberry understanding here. I'm just kind of the podcast help with that. But, um, you know, I, I think they call them rabbit eye and they are they are not grown wild, although there are blueberries that will grow wild. They're native to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but but the vast majority of blueberries that are eaten are are these high bush blueberries, either southern high bush, which you'd, you'd get in places like Florida or northern high bush. Um, and that's where most of our blueberries come from. But okay. um, I the nutritional thing doesn't sound right to me, but I don't know that I have the facts to really make a claim one way or the other. Nice. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to get with you after this interview and ch chat with anybody that you might recommend to come on a show. Cause I would love to learn yeah. more about that. Cause I was, I was clueless when it comes to wild blueberries. Oh yeah. Casey Cronquist from the U S high bush blueberry council. I'm sure would be, would be happy to talk to you about that. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, well, um, before I forget about it, another thing about Florida, that's really cool. Brahmin cattle are originally from India and that's why they're so used to this climate. Cause it's hot and humid in India. It's hot and humid here. And so that's why they're super adjusted to the Florida climate. I mean, you don't see a lot in North Florida. You see a lot of them central Florida, like Gainesville and down. There's a lot of Brahmin cattle. Very cool. I, yeah. I did not know that. I haven't spent near enough time in Florida. I've been kind of like the typical tourist who goes to a conference there and then flies out. I need to learn more <laughs> about Florida ag. In Orlando. It's a funny state. We, um, Allie and I, my wife, went. we went to a cruise the other day. And we drove down to Port Canaveral, and we always forget how big Florida is because you've got the Panhandle and then the Peninsula. And if you drove from Pensacola over to Jacksonville and then Jacksonville over down to Miami, that would be like a 15, 16 hour drive. Like, I mean, it is just straight and straight. And we always forget how big it is. I mean, it took us like, I think, seven hours to drive down to Port Canaveral, but it was a fun time. First cruise, we had the drink package. That was a good time. I regret getting the drink package because the f have you been on a cruise before? I, I've been on one really short cruise, like two night cruise. Oh, okay. Yeah. This was a this was a three night. We we got the drink package and we're like, you know what? It pays for itself if we get seven drinks per day and we'll be good. And that includes things like Coke and all that good stuff. But the first day we had like seven or eight. And then the next day we're like, no, let's take a break. And then I think we had one that night and one the next day. I was like, okay, so they get you. Oh, they yeah, get they've you because got you think you're out. planning it out. Oh, uh -huh. but the food was good. The food was good. But yeah, they, they definitely scanned us on the drink packages. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it's it. It reminded me a lot of like a theme park. It's like okay, they get enough oh, yeah. people through here that they have the, they have everything figured out. Oh, a hundred percent. It yeah. was so weird because I've never been on a boat that had an elevator. I mean, there were twelve floors. There was a shopping mall. There were pools. Everything. It was it was wild. It was it was yeah. a fun time though. So yeah, Port Canaveral. Um, I think it was the Independence of the Sea is the one we went on with uh, Royal Caribbean. So. Huh. Good time. Not agriculture related, but it was still a good time. So Fun nonetheless, yeah. <laughs> so another topic, carbon sequestration. Um, always blows my mind. What's I mean, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of died down a little bit in the past couple of maybe a year or two. Hmm. I feel like years ago, it was everybody was covering it. Carbon sequestration, how farmers can do it, this new technology. Like, have you covered that in the past? And like, what have you learned about it? Yeah, um, I, I do think you're right in that we went through a time where like everyone's minds were collectively blown. It's like, wait a minute, we can store all this carbon in our soil and farmers can be the answer. And, and you know, mm -hmm. regenerative agriculture is going to save us all. And now since then, I I think and, and I hate to speak collectively because there's obviously a lot of differences of, of opinion here. My perspective is that since then, there's been a little bit of more of a dose of reality, at least for me, of like, OK, Yes, carbon sequestration is part of the solution to mm -hmm. mitigating climate change. Like we do have a lot of capacity in our soil to store a lot of carbon, and we do have certain practices that can, at least in theory, help to sequester more carbon. Um, now, that has to be tempered with the whole notion that, look, carbon is always cycling in and out of our soil, right? It, it It's not something that we could just permanently put it there in like a lockbox, lock it away, right. continue farming. It doesn't work that way. Um but certainly there are practices that can help things like cover crops, things like reducing tillage um, can can help. Um, you know, I certainly have talked to a lot of people on it. The biggest problem is that uh, it comes in the economics of it. Like, OK, mm -hmm. if we want practice change to sequester more carbon, who pays for it? And, and a lot of people would say, oh, the companies that want to offset their carbon emissions will pay for it through carbon credits or things called insets, which basically just allows them to produce lower carbon 
you know, food or lower, lower carbon genes or whatever the case may be Off, offsets and insets. But, um, so who pays becomes the question and the people that are saying like, okay, you know, maybe for example, um, big food company can pay Nestle can pay as an example. Um, and Nestle's like, all right, well, you know, I potentially would be interested in paying, but I, I need to know for sure that how much carbon is being sequestered and that that carbon is going to stay there. And, mm-hmm. That's where it becomes trickier. <laughs> we have models that say, theoretically, in this soil, if you were to use these practices, you were to, you know, uh, sequester this much carbon. But number one, those are models. So it's not exact. And number two, it do- they don't account for any sort of variability. And number three, you know, they don't necessarily account for any practice change after the fact that might mm-hmm. release that carbon back into the atmosphere. So I think that's where you're seeing maybe this hype cycle of like, oh, this is going to save us all and make farmers a bunch of money to like, OK, there's something here that is helpful but we have a lot of details to figure out measurement, verification, permanence, which is that whole notion of like how much carbon is actually being sequestered long term. There's a lot of questions. So it doesn't make for a near as clean of a headline. Um, but we are definitely still seeing investments in this space. In fact, you know, uh, climate investing seems to be one of the very few sort of like venture capital areas tangential to agriculture that still seems to be going strong. We're getting mm-hmm. a lot of this climate smart funding from the government. There is a lot of interest in this being one piece of, of climate change mitigation, although nowhere near maybe the, the uh, exuberance of like, hey, if we just plant a cover crop, we're reversing climate change, which, you know, uh, there's there's really not data to support that that outlandish claim, but it doesn't mean it's all bunk. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Now it might have changed, but it was my understanding that for farmers to qualify for carbon sequestration, it had to be done. They had to be sequestering carbon on new land, so it couldn't have been something like, for example, um, cover crops. It would they would have to plant cover crops on new acreage, which they haven't been doing in the past. Was that correct, or has that changed? Yeah, this is sort of the the addition problem. So um, yeah. it's not necessarily new land, like land they've never farmed before, but it would have to be like a land they've never Im- implemented that practice on before. Right. You know, because otherwise, like you know, if if you're using today's um, climate challenge, like okay, today you know some climate scientist has figured how much extra carbon is in in the atmosphere. Um, And then you're wanting to kind of get counted for carbon that's sort of already been sequestered because you've already been using those practices. They're like, well, that doesn't really get us anywhere. So we can't pay for those. Um, But yeah, that does create a a problem on the part of the farmer where it's like, look, guys, I've been trying to do this for years. I've kind of figured it out. It's kind of tough to see other people who weren't interested before now get all the money for it. So Mm -hmm. I definitely see where they're coming from. And that's that's another problem that probably needs to be figured out and get incentives aligned with the, you know, the type of behavior that they're really intended for. Yeah, I've seen a lot of interest in this topic because a video that I made on YouTube, like maybe like three years ago, it was on carbon sequestration and it was just kind of briefly explaining what it is, what farmers are doing, what these companies are doing. And it got like 50 to 100 views within like the first month. And I was like, okay, great. And then um, a year later, I think it was up to a thousand views. And then within like two or three months of that, it was up to 20,000 and 30,000 views. Oh man. (laughs) And it's, it's steadily getting views and everybody that comments on it, they're like, oh, this is a great idea, but I'm a farmer from Nebraska. I don't think it would work for me because I've been doing this for years. And also it's difficult to calculate how much carbon we'd be yep. sequestering. So it's been a very hot button issue that a lot of people are just, they're not hesitant about it, but they have, I don't know, no, no, maybe they are hesitant about it. Like they think it can work, but we need to improve the whole process about like tracking the carbon, making sure that farmers that have been doing it, letting them still apply for carbon credits and all that good stuff. But, but yeah, yeah I think it's, I think it's definitely a good technology, but I don't know. We'll see where it goes maybe. Well, you you obviously have had a front row seat to the to kind of where the exuberance is at and where the skepticism is at for sure. Um, yeah, I did I did an episode in January that was um, uh, with a professor at Iowa State who has evaluated thirteen different carbon programs because there's all these programs mm. that came out and they're all slightly different, but most of them want to lock in farmers to long term contracts and and farmers are understandably very very hesitant to do something yeah. like that i understand why it's good for the permanence factors like hey if you're just going to do a practice one year and then totally do something else the next year then uh you know it's it's much harder to to uh, provide those incentives but um yeah there's so much that still needs to get figured out yeah speaking of getting stuff figured out vertical farming has been 
huge. Mm-hmm. And I know that's something you like to talk about. I love talking about it. Um, before we get into that, months ago, there was a huge shift with Aero Farms. Like, didn't they file for bankruptcy and they were a leader in this space? Well, yeah, and they're not the only ones. Um, the, whole, the whole category has been hit very hard. Um, it's, it's one of those that, uh, due to kind of unit economics, uh, they weren't profitable mm. companies, but they were growing companies and growing by in terms of like um, building new facilities, setting up new kind of like offtake agreements with uh, retailers and that sort of thing. But really, they were entirely propped up by the venture capital, the venture yeah. capital that they were bringing in. So as soon as the you know, the spout of the venture capital funding started to dry up. A lot of them started to fall off. Um, now, though, you know, it's not like the concept of vertical farming is gone forever, uh, mm-hmm. but it's 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 certainly representative of the reality check I think we're seeing right now all through ag tech, which is like, look, how close is this is this to viability? How close <laughs> is this to profitability? And if it's not close, uh, I don't know that I want to risk my capital on it. And uh, so it's I, I call it a recalibration that we're seeing in ag tech right now. Vertical farming is probably feeling it more acutely, more severely than a lot of other the categories. Uh, but it's happening throughout, which is, you know, you, you can't survive on on new influxes of venture capital forever. And it, it's time to kind of find sustainable business models. Yeah, it's interesting to see each of those companies, I feel like, bring something very, very unique and their own little twist on vertical farming. Like Vertical Harvest, they have um, underserved communities that work for them. We've had them on the show and they are amazing. You've got Aero Farms and something they were working on years ago was drones that fly around and they have like a, they were developing a camera that the camera would monitor the crops to see how they're doing. Because, you know, when you've got like 50 feet tall of vertical farming equipment, you can't climb a ladder very quickly. So you got the drones. And then I interviewed a company from Austin, Texas, I believe called Eden greens and their growing technology was very different in just how they grow um, the systems, how they grow the plants and everything. So it's cool to kind of see how each of them are trying to set themselves apart from all the competition, whether it's with the genetics of the plants they're growing, the technology, or I don't know, the secondary technology that they're developing to help with all the vertical farming. It is cool. Uh, on the other hand, I would say um, sometimes we get a little bit too obsessed with the technology and mm-hmm. and maybe not obsessed enough with the customer of like understanding, all right, who's buying this stuff and what do they care about? You know, do they care that I use drones to produce their lettuce? Maybe some do, but probably in general, no. And so I think the ones that are going to survive are the ones that have been able to stay laser focused. I The term I just used was obsessed with the customer and what value they're really providing that customer because, uh, it's a, you're probably a little bit like me in that, like I get excited about the technology, but it's not what sustains a business unless the technology is helping you as an, you know, means to an ends to really creating, um, I would say differentiated value, value, enough value that a consumer is willing to identify it and, and even pay more for it. Uh, and that's what vertical farming is in general failed to do. That reminds me of one of the famous quotes from Jurassic park. Um, Scientists were too preoccupied with can we that they didn't think about should we. <laughs> I like it. I'm always up for a Jurassic Park quote. <laughs> it is is so great. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, even thinking about the drones, I was like, that's cool. But how much money are you pumping in to develop the drones when you could just get a normal drone and fly up there? And if one looks wilted, you could, I don't know, check it out or something like that. Yeah, yeah that, that's very we, we sometimes do get self obsessed with the technology like, hey, let's create this million dollar technology that will separate us from everybody else instead of making our product good for the end user, like as well as best as it can be for the end user. Absolutely. And in an environment like we're in now where capital is much, much, much harder to come by, uh, you have to use those precious dollars only for things Mm -hmm. that are going to uh, improve your relationship and your credibility with the customer in my, in my, in my mind. I mean, you can, you can continue to drive down costs and that's important, but uh, ultimately if you're not creating differentiated value on the part of the consumer, you're going to have a real, real, real uphill battle. How do you think um, those vertical farming companies can do that? Like, how do you think they can gain customer loyalty? Well, I, you know, loyalty would be one strategy. Um, I think there's some interesting opportunities in, in some uh, differentiated crops. You know, I had um, a guy on the show last summer and boy, um, his name's escaping me. And so I, I apologize, but he's from uh, True Leaf, which is a Canadian based vertical farming company. 
and uh, they're they're looking at uh, pharmaceuticals. So like, can we grow crops for more pharmaceutical purposes? And I'm not talking about marijuana here, just uh, yeah, yeah. D- different types of pharmaceuticals. I think, you know, that's maybe a, a value add. Uh, but honestly, like this is how I became a little bit interested in indoor aquaculture, not to not to segue here, but um, you know, my, my thought process, and let me preface this by saying I'm not an expert on aquaculture at all, but, Mm -hmm. uh, my thought process was this, uh, which is what, you know, what could we do that's indoors that ends up with a bit of a, a more valuable product, more valuable than basil, more valuable than, you know, leafy greens. And, um, you know, what I kind of came up with is like, okay, well, you know, indoor aquaculture, you're, you're kind of using the same facilities. You probably don't need as much energy because you don't need the grow light necessarily. Of course, again, I'm not an expert. Maybe you do need just as much energy for the pumps and whatnot, uh, and filters, but, uh, also you're providing a product that has a lot more protein, has Mm -hmm. a lot more caloric density. Um, and I think maybe some of the hype that has gone towards vertical farming, may need to look at more of what we're doing with indoor aquaculture. And I, I just recently interviewed um, uh, the founder of open or excuse me, transparency, transparency. It's it's uh, it's a play on words, though. So it's transparent and then S.E.A. Anyway, oh, OK, OK. They're in L.A. and they're doing indoor prawn farming uh, for kind of high end restaurants. And I, I don't know. I think that thing is is more interesting to me than vertical farming, because uh, my, my biggest concern with it is like, I just don't know that the amount of energy and the amount of labor that goes into it to produce lettuce really, um, I don't, I don't see as big of an opportunity there as I see a race to the bottom of who can produce the cheapest lettuce. <laughs> cause, mm. cause I, I, I don't, I have never tasted a, a, a single leaf of lettuce that I'm saying like, okay, I'm willing to pay more <laughs> for that than other lettuce. Cause it's kind of, and maybe it's cause I'm, you know, uh, a meat eater, but, uh, it's just hard to differentiate. Whereas I haven't tried his prawns, but this transparency, you know, you could just, you could watch videos of him on YouTube. Like they're producing really high quality prawns in a really clean environment. And he's got a very compelling story about where your shrimp is coming from that you may not want to know unless you have a source for higher quality shrimp. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, that kind of goes back with like, like you're saying the um, energy consumption and really sustainability. I mean, there's so much energy required for growing lettuce and then you look at, at fish and other um, sea creatures like prawns. When it comes to fish, for every pound of feed they get, they gain a pound of mass. Like they are right. super sustainable versus pork, chicken, beef, or whatever. So yeah, I feel like you could definitely have more of an impact if you focus on aquaculture. Like somebody that I don't know. I feel like you have a better experience with eating fish, eating shrimp versus lettuce. I mean, lettuce is great, but it's lettuce. Yeah. And there are higher quality or higher value herbs, but still nowhere yeah. close to the value you're going to get from something like a, a really high quality prawn. Um, and then there's that whole side of the supply chain that we don't always know about, which is there's a lot of like mangrove forests, which are huge carbon sequester sequesters that are being taken out to farm shrimp in other parts mm. of the world. Uh, and then, of course, you know, all of the uh, overfishing problems and et cetera that, that go on, like preserving the ocean ecosystems in a lot of ways that uh, I think is compelling. But anyway, this is more of just something that I've recently been thinking about. It's not my area of expertise, but I think it's worth thinking like, OK, we, we are at a pro- we're at a point right now where vertical farming as a category has had some big, big challenges. Maybe mm-hmm. we should rethink what has staying power. And in some cases, it's the hyper local, know your farmer, direct to consumer type. That's cool. In other cases, it might be different crops. In other cases, maybe it's like, hey, let's let's grow something that's got a higher you know caloric density that has some protein uh, that might be a little bit more nutritious for the consumer. Um, not to say that you know, leafy greens aren't healthy. They are. They're just not a lot of calories there and not a Mm -hmm. lot of nutrition. Um, And I I don't know. That's where I arrive at, I think, an an interest in indoor aquaculture for me. So there's some system. I need to look it up. I saw it in a textbook when I was teaching and I I need to look it up. But there's some system with aquaculture where you can include chickens and growing plants. And it's like a perfect symbiotic relationship where you grow worms. The worms feed the um the chickens and you can also feed them the fish and then the fish um you can use to filter out for the plants that you're growing and then the chickens can get some good water and so it's like this perfect symbiotic relationship i can't remember what it's called 
but I think that would be cool to see it like not a huge scale, but at like, you know, kind of like a, a larger scale to see if that can be actually done where you've got produce, fish and chicken gr- like raised in one system. Yeah. Is that, is that maybe black soldier fly larva that, uh, yes. Is yeah, that yeah, yeah. Worms? yeah. Yeah. I've looked into that some, I, again, I think that's something that's interesting. Um, and like you said, probably something interesting to see on a, on a small scale to see how it works. Um, but boy, then you're taking kind of three dramatically different systems and trying to make them all work, which, um, I, I think fighting mother nature for one system is hard enough. You know, I think that's the problem I have with a lot of the aquaculture or not aquaculture, but, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, aquaponics systems. Yeah. It's like, okay, are you optimizing for the fish or for the plants? Cause it's certainly hard to do both. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> This is kind of embarrassing. I have a horror story from when I was teaching. Um, we had, a, this is my second year teaching. We had a 500 gallon tank and we were growing um, tomatoes and stuff in the top. So we had tilapia in the tank, fish up here. Uh, so it would recirculate. Well, we had gotten the tilapia and they were maybe like three inches large. And we're like, all right, whenever they're big enough, we're going to harvest them. We're going to have a fish fry. We're going to eat the tomatoes. It's going to be great. Well, one day I got to school and I had a student there before class and he would always go in there and check them. And he was like, Mr. Williams, the fish are gone. And I was like, are you kidding me? And so we looked and looked, couldn't find them at all. And I called one of our vice principals. I'm like, hey, this is weird, but I think somebody stole our fish. Like, we don't know where they are. And um, so we kept looking and looking. And then my seventh period class, we went out there, we looked. And one student reached his hand down there and he picked up like this little black object. And we're like, oh, that's the filter for the pump. And then we realized we're like, oh no, the filter for the water pump had fallen off and the hole was just large enough that the tilapia could go into. And then through the PVC pipe and everything else, we found bones and scales. And so essentially the pump had sucked up the the little baby tilapias and we were like, well, all right. So that was a very humbling phone call to the principal. I was like, Hey, nobody stole our fish. That was a my bad. I'm sorry. So don't oh, worry about no. it. <laughs> so kind that of a is, yeah. It's, <laughs> it it's awful. A, I mean, even on a small scale, right? It's a lot to it's a lot oh, to yeah. manage. And mm-hmm. so uh, whenever you're talking about this, and I try to keep this in mind as someone myself who is not a farmer, it's like these are complex systems. Change is very risky. One change oh, yeah. could you know one change could set in motion. Um, something that none of us can foresee and have a lot of unforeseen consequences. So when we talk about in ag tech, like, well, farmer doesn't want to adopt this or doesn't want to adopt that. It's like, I don't blame them. Like, you know, I, I, you better be dang sure that you have your downside protected and that the upside is pretty good before you change anything in a system as complex as a farm. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, that was like, not even a, like just a tiny glimpse into it. Cause we had a limited budget. And by that, I mean, we had no budget. It was just like my salary that we were buying stuff for. And so like the plants weren't thriving. So I'm like, do I add fertilizer? Oh, wait, the fertilizer has to be safe for the fish. If I give like, I have to make sure that they're both going to be fine. And so I didn't really do anything because I didn't know what to do. But yeah, I mean, if if it, like farmers are so careful, because if if I don't know, a new pesticide comes out, a new fertilizer, like if it's you've got to make sure that the benefits of that are going to be proven a hundred percent because the risk involved is just monumental. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I love that story, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm I'm going to leave it in there. I don't (laughs) mind the, the, the self shame. That was funny. That was, very humbling, but, but I mean, you know, it was funny. It was a good growing moment with, with the students. Yeah. And you know, anyone who's ever done anything like that, as small as a garden or as large as a, you know, commercial dairy, you, you can relate to that because things will oh, go yeah. wrong. You will not think of everything and things will happen and you'll be like, Oh no. I mean, that's very relatable. Uh, you see, I feel like those are more teachable than, yeah. you know, preparing with a lesson or reading in a textbook. Like you learn like, not only do you learn, but the consequences help reinforce that where you're like, crap, I don't need to do this again. So let me do everything I can to prevent it. Right. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> and I'm somebody who has to make every mistake in the book, you know, until <laughs> before I'm actually good at anything. Well, hey, practice makes perfect. I can't tell you how many times I've messed up on podcast questions, videos, editing and all that good stuff to finally, you know, become halfway decent at it. So yeah. it takes a while. You're killing it on YouTube, by the way. You got to give me some YouTube tips after this. Thanks. It, it's been fun. I I tried to. I had Joel Salatin on a couple months ago, and he's you know huge on on YouTube. And so 
that really caused a lot of growth. Like the, the whole interview with him has seen like exponential growth so far. I think it's got like 25, 30,000 views so far, nice. which is nice. And I stole the video. I think of him that got a lot of traction. I stole a thumbnail from his interview with Joe Rogan because we, I like, I asked him like what it was like being on that podcast. And so I took that thumbnail, edited it a little bit and then put it up as my thumbnail and it got some traction. So That's I was like, great. Right. It, um, a good podcaster is a good thief. <laughs> Steal like an artist. That's what Austin Cleon says. Yeah, exactly. Oh, speak, yeah. Speaking of that, have you read? Um, I think he might be the author. Steal like an artist. The little yeah. book. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I've got. That's his, great. His, it's a three book set. So steal like an artist. Nice. Show your work and keep going. All three are like, I I think essential books for anyone trying to create anything. They're super good. Yeah, I just picked up um, Show Your Work, and it's really good. I'm halfway through it, and it's been a really good read so far. I mean, just like, you know, how to differentiate yourself from other creators online, like how to show your work, how to... I really liked him saying, like, you're not an expert, you're a guide. Yeah. And I struggled with that for a while, because I'm like, you know, I'm not the agriculture expert, I am interviewing the agriculture experts. And so I'm like trying to shift that a little bit. Like, I'm not the expert, I'm the guide, come along with me, and we can learn. So you're, you're more like a Sherpa, really. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the way he he puts those books together, they're pieces of art. So you could just pick up, you could flip to any page, yeah. pick up a book, flip to any page, be like, oh, that's interesting. You don't need to read them cover to cover, although I highly recommend that too. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. You can just open up any any um, any chapter and they're all filled with like nuggets of wisdom. Like they're not drawn out or anything, which yeah. always is very, very appreciated. Um, now, before we move on from vertical farming, I, I, I talked to you that um, farming in space I was producing a podcast that didn't really go anywhere, but we interviewed a couple people with companies like Interstellar Labs, mm. and they were developing these pods that can attach to the International Space Station, and essentially they attach, and then they inflate, and then they grow vertical farms in there, <laughs> and I thought that was super cool, and so we learned more about how the pod, the fabric on the outside, has to be, um, it has a certain threshold for meteorites it has to pass, like it has to be just i don't know like just sturdy enough where nothing's going to puncture it and i was like you know that's an interesting problem that you only have to solve in space and then they're trying to do the same thing for um farming on the moon or farming in on mars whenever we go there so i thought that was really cool and that's a space i want to learn more about because i feel like that will be something maybe a future trend in another decade or something as we venture beyond earth so i think that'll be fun That'd be cool. And I think that gets back to the conversation courses where I'm transfixed on is like protein. So like, how are you going to get the protein? Oh, yeah. You can farm the vegetables and that's good. uh, But but where are you going to get the protein? And and who knows? Maybe that that is a place where shrimp or fish can can aquaculture can be up there. But yeah, the interesting part with space is like the cost. And I'm going to get this wrong because it's been several years since I, (laughs) I, I, I did this interview. But I believe the cost is something like to get to the international space station, it's like a hundred thousand dollars per kilogram. So like to get any weight of anything up there and, and you would need to ship water, you know, you, you would need to ship, you know, soil if you're using it, of course, maybe one benefit to vertical farming is you don't need any soil, like ton, you know, a lot of mass and at a hundred thousand dollars a kilogram, if, if I'm remembering that right. Um, it's an interesting problem to try to think through, uh, I, yeah, I don't know how they're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard similar numbers. I mean, kind of going full, full circle. I think that might be a great place for cellular agriculture. I yeah, mean, because sure. you can just bring up a little bit and then you put it in the bioreactor and it grows and it grows and it grows. So astronauts are still getting protein, but you can also kind of, I don't know, like I, I think that would be really cool because you can't ship a cow to the moon. I mean, you can't do that. That's going to be really difficult. That's a whole other plethora of problems yeah. going on there. So yeah. cellular agriculture might be a good fix for that. So I don't know. Right. But, yeah. but yeah, I think that'll be cool. I mean, there's so much going on because, yeah, I mean, whether it's, I wonder how it, I wonder how things like aquaculture would work in like a zero gravity environment. Like they're in the water. Can they still swim around? Like, I, oh, no, you know, yeah, probably not. <laughs> yeah yeah Why right not? and and then how are they gonna get oxygen like i mean well i don't know like yeah i, I, I don't know how that works uh, yeah that well i mean so uh i'm sure it affects how you have to um water plants as well so like maybe yeah. you could use like an aeroponic type environment where you're you're kind of spritzing the water on the roots maybe mm-hmm. even up i don't know i'm not sure how they do all that 
So, yeah, I, I looked up some stuff on what NASA does, and they've done some experiments on growing stuff in space. And essentially, the roots are in like a bag, kind of. And then, you know, they're around grow lights and everything. And then they, in that bag, they inject the water and the nutrients where it's like very, it's like vacuum, not vacuum sealed, but basically the water has nowhere to go. And Can't so escape. those roots yeah. are, yeah, they're, so they're going to be fully emerged. And then I guess they let it drain or something. Then they let it get oxygen. So yeah, very labor intensive. But yeah, yeah. I, I looked up some pictures and it looks super cool. That is cool. Cause yeah, then, then you've got the whole problem of like, you know, the, the plants themselves, you know, they need uh the gas exchange as well to to function yeah. so i don't yeah i don't know it takes uh, i didn't do well enough in plant physiology to even venture a guess at how they work on that <laughs> yeah same i i read some article i'll try to find it but they were talking about when it comes to growing stuff in space like that you want the the edible biomass is what you've got to pay attention to like you don't want something that's going to have a super huge root structure right that can grow very well and have a small root ball or whatever um so like going to be impossible to grow things like potatoes tubers stuff like that so you need something that can have a small amount of roots and then grow up like a lettuce not really tomatoes because you've got a large part of the stem leaves Mm. and then the tomatoes but like things like um, spinach leafy greens where you can eat most of it can be very beneficial Hmm. wow that's a cool topic um so what is the future looking like for your ag history series really on your on your show the future of agriculture like what are some future topics you're looking at exploring yeah uh i have two coming up before the end of the year i hope i hope i can get both of them done uh one of them is um uh a guy named cyrus uh cyrus mccormick who uh was a a farmer in the 1800s who ended up creating kind of the the uh uh, what do they call it? The Reaper, it eventually becoming like one of the first mechanical harvesters for um, for field crops. You know, small nice. grains like wheat and barley and that sort of thing. And then uh, e- eventually, it, his technology ended up getting either acquired or somehow merged with mm. International Harvester and became International Harvester. So I wanted to do something on machinery and something with harvesting. Um, I do a quarterly presenting sponsor and in this quarter it's it's Farmwave, which has an artificial intelligence uh, technology that um, monitors combine yield loss. And so I was like, oh, it'd be fun to do something with a harvester, like history of the harvester. And so anyway, I think that's where I'm going next. And then one later in the quarter, um, my friend Jeanette Barnard, who occasionally does guest hosting on the podcast, um, has a book that she loves called Cattle Kingdom, sort of about the history of kind of Western U.S. cattle ranches, mm. I think. I haven't read it mm-hmm. yet. So on my <laughs> list to read so that we can do an episode on that. So th- those are the two. I'm trying to do two a quarter. Um, gotcha. I find one a month is maybe just a little bit too much, especially if I have to read a book and then really absorb notes and then do a bunch of online research. I kind of need more time for that sort of stuff. Uh, But I try to do two a quarter, but I have no shortage of ideas. And that's part of the reason why I'm like, okay, I want to start this as a regular thing because I can keep generating idea after idea after idea. You know, I'd love to go back to like, you know, ancient civilizations that had um, irrigation and kind of understand mm. what do we know about the irrigation systems and how they were developed and what was important and, you know, how they held water and, and you know, what crops they were working on, things like that. I mean, there's just no shortage of uh, of interesting historical agriculture things. And I, I kind of looked around. And I couldn't find that content anywhere. So I thought, shoot, let's let's do it. That kind of goes back to that, um, the trending question, how often did you think about, of the Roman Empire Not, <laughs> whenever it comes to like never. the aqueducts and everything? <laughs> for me, for me, never. But then now I'm talking about it. I'm like, oh, maybe sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> maybe every once in a while. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. I mean, when it comes to content creation, I love doing that stuff because you get to learn about it and yes. you get to present it. Like the best way to learn is to teach others. And so whether you're reading a book, watching videos, preparing a podcast or whatever it might be, like you can learn best doing that. Like I learned so much about carbon sequestration when I made that video. And so it's it's super fun. So you go to learn it and then you can teach it. And then you are like, you know what? I kind of know a lot about this, this subject. Like not everything, I'm scratching the surface, but I know a lot more than I did when I started it. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of my stretch ambition with this that, that I haven't really told anybody about, but I'll, I'll talk about here is like, um, there's been times in the past where somebody has been like, Oh, you, you've talked to so many interesting people, you know, 380 episodes about the future of agriculture. You really have some condensed insights. Why don't you put that in the form of a book? And, and hmm. there's, there's two answers to that one is no, because I don't really feel like I have a unique 
like unifying point of view to bring to the world on that. But then the second answer, and maybe the more relevant one to our conversation is if you write a book about the future of agriculture, it's pretty much outdated as soon as you publish it. Uh, Mm. No offense to other people who have written books about the future of agriculture, but I think it's pretty much outdated as soon as you publish it. Now on the flip side, if I do, you know, 50 of these history of ag innovation episodes, there might be a book there that that is oh, yeah. interesting to to put together. And, and that's sort of like uh, something in, back, in the back of my mind as well. Yeah, that's a cool idea. I mean, you could build up 50, 60 different episodes and then you've got like a whole that's like a textbook on the history of agriculture. And that would, I mean, literally never go out of date because it's history. That'd be cool. You might see that in a classroom in the future. That'd be super cool. Yeah, I think so. Specifically focused on ag innovation. Um I don't know that there's a book out there like that right now. So anyway, that's that's on the back of my mind too. And so I'm, I'm sort of laying the early groundwork for something like that. That's super fun. I, yeah, I think that when it comes to podcasting, like making new and exciting content is always a good idea for, I don't know, attracting new listeners. Like, and oh, like also like keeping your show fresh and also um, encouraging you and like getting, you know, like you get that pep in your step because you're like, I got this new project, this new idea instead of like the same old, same old. You nailed it right there. I mean, the hardest part uh, about podcasting is consistency, right? Mm-hmm. And the hardest part about consistency is like st- keeping yourself fresh and interested and excited. And so there's been several inter- iterations of the podcast over the years where I've had to like, okay, rethink some things and uh, liven it up. And this is the most recent one, which is why I love talking about it, because this is what I'm most excited about right now. Yeah. So at what point... Um at what point do you think it's okay to add a new segment to a show versus starting a new podcast entirely? Because I've seen people do both where they add a new set a segment to their show or they just create an entirely new podcast where they've got two podcasts now. So where do, where do you think you kind of draw that li- the, the line? Yeah, I would say, first of all, it's it starts with how clear is the show on its premise right now? So mm-hmm. if it's a really clear and direct premise, for example, you know, mine is focused on agricultural innovation. So anything yeah. outside of the theme of agricultural innovation, which is the reason I probably wouldn't do just like a history of agriculture without it having to do with some sort of innovation, because it would be sort of outside of the scope uh, of my show. So like it is a history of agriculture, but it's more on the the innovations that that catalyzed you know new tra- new advancements in agriculture. Um, so if your premise is really clear and it doesn't meet your premise, new show. Uh, but you know if your premise is really clear and it's like okay, I see how that connects to the premise. I I would totally. I would totally experiment with segments. I've done it over the years. I think you've done some Friday episodes. I've done some. Yeah. I, I, at one point I did a follow up Friday, which is we're going to go back and spend five minutes with a previous guest just to get an update from them. At one point I did a farmer Friday, which is like, I, okay, we're only going to focus on farmers on Friday. I've, I've messed around with a lot of different stuff over the years. It's always fun in the moment because it's like new and exciting and this could be something. And then you got to evaluate. And if it, if it's not something that you could sustain long term or you're interested in sustaining long term, then switch it up. But yeah, I think it starts with having that super clear premise. Yeah, that's very true. It's fun being your own boss and you you have the creativity and I don't know, really the you, you can do whatever you want. Like you can add those sections, subtract them, yeah. do whatever you want. But yeah, that's a good idea. Like as long as your message is very clear, like that one show is good, unless it's like totally different. That I mean, I had I had an idea. I, I've been toying with the idea of getting back into fitness. I mean, I say back, but I mean like actually into fitness. And I've been toying with the idea over over the past couple of weeks of like starting a new a new podcast called I Suck at Fitness. So I'm <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe that'll be something, maybe it won't. I don't know. But you know, at least another project, nothing something to get the wheels turning. So we'll see. The nice thing, I mean, we live in 2023. Like you can do that. If you want to try oh, yeah. something new and put it out in the world and see what see how it goes. Um, you know, obviously you know what it takes to grow an audience. You've done it once. And so, you know, not to quit too early, but if it's Mm -hmm. not working, you'll have a good sense because you've, you've done the reps to, to see content, how content creation works, what resonates with audiences, what doesn't, I mean, you've put in the reps, so you'll, you'll be able to see it. I, man, I'm all about that stuff. Go for it. You know, I have a, I have a wild idea of like, uh, of, of doing a, a podcast where, the uh so all right this is more of a tangent than than probably we need at this point because i know we're trying to wrap things up but um so one of the best things that's helped me in in podcasting and really a lot of elements of my life is during covid i started taking improv classes and i just no way yeah awesome i love doing improv and so i'm part of an improv group right now and i'm like i would love to do an improv based podcast that's like news from the natural world where we're talking about like let's say um 
you know, let's say that like we had this, we have this mass migration that happens in our area sometimes of Mormon crickets and these like millions and millions of crickets that are crossing the street. It's like, okay, we're going to do something. We're going to talk <laughs> about these, this Mormon cricket migration from the perspective of the cricket. And so I'm going to bring in these improvisers and we're going to, we're going to improvise like as crickets do this interview or do this uh, podcast episode. Uh, but, but do that with all sorts of different biological, like insects, plants, I don't know. I just think a bit news from the natural world would be super fun. But anyway, that's a total tangent. I don't even know where I started, where that even came from. But I love that idea. Try new ideas. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, you can do it from like I don't know a polar bear's perspective on the melting ice caps. Exactly. And just get something like that. Yes. And I, I'm but, I'm in this troop with these really talented improvisers <laughs> where like if I can give them just like the basics, here's the basic science of what we want to talk about, and then you guys just take it and improvise. Just put a uh, mic in front of them. I, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just thinking of like from the that polar bear's perspective, he'd be like, yeah, I don't know what the hell's going on, but you know what? My the land resale value is going down, but the same thing's happening for Deborah across the way. So I'm not too worried about it. But exactly. the penguins are still here. I'm still fat and happy. So it, it's not that big of a deal. Totally. Oh, yeah. And it's <laughs> it, we're talking as we're talking right now, it's fat bear week. So we could do a great fat bear episode. Uh I mean, there's so many options. Remember when that fly was on Mike Pence's hair during the debate? Yes. You could, yeah, the fly could be reporting live from the presidential debate. I mean, you could do all sorts. Of, you could do all sorts of stuff. That's so great. I'm just thinking, what kind of accent would that fly have? Would it be like a southern accent or like some European or something? You know, that's why that's where you bring in these talented improvisers because it's always amazing, like what they can come up with. It's fun. That's awesome. I never, I never watched it, but I love watching clips of it. And that's who, whose line is it anyway? Oh, yeah. I mean, so it's good. some of the best improv. It's so funny. Yeah. No, those guys. And there's some of them are still out there touring and doing improv. They're so good. Uh, and yeah, just hilarious. Yeah, we saw the, we saw the first season of The Masked Singer, and I think Wayne Brady won it. Oh, he, did he? He yeah. was he killed it. He was so good at singing. Yep. And then you're like, he's good at improv. Like, what can he not do? Like, he was really good. He is. He's awesome. Yeah, he was one of my favorites when I watched the show. Classic. But then I think he was on Dancing with the Stars, and I think he lost. So oh. he can do a lot, but he can't dance. Okay, so we found what he can't do. <laughs> we found his one weakness. <laughs> Well, Tim, it's been great ch chatting with you. Great to reconnect. I know we had you on years ago, so great to have you on to just kind of talk about all things agriculture and your podcast. Like, If people want to listen to you, where can they go? Yeah, uh, the podcast is called Future of Agriculture on any podcast player or just futureofagriculture.com. And uh, yeah, would love to hear what you think and always open for discussions. Usually on Twitter or LinkedIn is where I'm most active. Sweet. Yeah, you're super active on Twitter and LinkedIn, which is which is great. So thanks so much for being on, Tim. We appreciate it. It was a blast, Trevor. Thank you.